in, in the event of time, I don't necessarily like to um, read bios because I think we all were taught to read them in fourth grade. Did you all have to write bios in fourth grade? We did in Springfield, see? My bio was fabulous in fourth grade. I had done, I'd won the spelling bee. My word was loquacious, L-O-Q-U-I-C-O-U-S. I still know how to spell it and everything, right? Um, Mike Quigley has proudly represented Illinois' 5th District for more than 13 years. Since being elected to Congress in 2009, he has been devoted to fighting for our environment, small businesses, and the LGBTQ community, healthcare access, and ending gun violence. That is just a snippet of the things that we have to thank this hardworking congressman for. Um, one of Chicago's own and one of our favorites, I present to you all, Congressman Mike Quigley. You coming that way? Okay. Your water's under here. You got it, okay. Thanks, Jerry. Okay, welcome. I've got to turn this one on too because I'm gonna move around. I'm gonna channel my e inner Steve Karnacki today. <laughs> you MSNBC nerds out there. I'm one too. Um, first, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's always great to be back with you in the incredibly important work the City Club does to draw together uh, Chicago's best and brightest, talk about the critical issues of the day. So it, uh, it also helps me focus on where we are it's of the anniversary, right? Or where are we at now? What do we have to do? Because you have to ask yourself, what are we going to talk about? <clears throat> and what's important? Uh, before I do that, though, I do want to recognize and thank my extraordinary staff that's here today. Josie, yay, she's coming in from D.C. Hey, Daddy. <laughs> Victoria Ohms, my comm director, a new resident of Chicago. They helped me write this staff. And they're my unofficial uh, tan tangent cops that remind me where I was three tangents ago. <laughs> that used to be uh, Aviva Bowen's job uh, before she escaped to become one of Chicago's best political advisors. Uh, she always smiles. Yeah, I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> <clears throat> who, who knew? So look, this is tough. Uh, you know, asking yourself, what do you talk about? Because you don't want to sound like you don't care about the things you don't talk about. So I thought I would capture everything with one um, argument and my Steve Karnacki board here. It's not digital, it's not high tech, so it's perfectly quiggly. Uh, <clears throat> and if you can understand this, uh, good luck. <laughs> so uh, look, we could talk about economy, jobs, national security, Ukraine, Immigration, climate change, health care, education, public safety. My point today is it doesn't matter if you can't govern, right? So you think about, okay, what do you call a speech like this? And I thought of America is back, or is it? America is back, but for how long? Now, I didn't invent that. That came from a... President Biden talking to the caucus. And he told us, I went and spoke to our allies, and I told them, America is back. And their reaction was what I just said. Really? Or for how long? Because they see a, a most perfectly divided government in a country where elections are won by the number of people that could fit in Soldier Field. So they're not so sure about that. And then, you know, what's the impetus for talking about this? You know, what are you thinking about when you, what do you do when you think about writing a speech like this? So obviously I thought about being in the chambers on January 6th when the violent extremists broke down the doors in an attempt to overturn the results of a free and fair election. Uh, and people say, like, wait, we, we have amnesia about this already. Just remember. The insurrectionists were about 70 feet away from number two, number three, and number four in succession in our country. I thought about when the former president pulled us out of the Paris Climate Agreement 
ending an extremely important alliance to mitigate the climate crisis. I thought about it when the former president withdrew us from the Iranian nuclear deal, and now we're in a much worse situation. Uh, and the second part of what President Biden said to us, I thought about it when he said, he talked to President Putin and Xi, and they both said, your system doesn't work anymore. Now, I suppose Putin might want to reconsider that after this weekend. <laughs> but their point is, the world. what they said to the president was, the world is such a complicated place, it's impossible to aggregate people's desires and needs, and it just doesn't work. You just need a strong person to get it done. So it's not just us that, it's not just those presidents talking about that. I'll read a few poll results to you today, but the one that's most disturbing is, uh, a couple of years ago we did a poll, is uh, democracy always the best form of government, right? 31% said no. Sometimes they're so discouraged, anything else might work, even an authoritarian form of government. About 12 years ago, that same poll was taken in uh, Hungary before the strongman became uh, the leader there with almost exactly the same results. I thought about it when we had to stand off on the debt limit and we came within a whisker of destroying markets and putting millions of people out of work. And I see these things that have moved us farther apart by those actions. Uh, these events and the extraordinary anger that was always simmering beneath the surface means me a question of whether we're able to govern, which is fundamental to any of the other things that you care about. Uh, and I think this is amplified by what, limiting voting rights, denying equality of LGBTQ individuals, taking away reproductive rights, and the polarization and the threats of violence. It's doubled and quadrupled since I took office towards members of Congress. And even those things draw us apart. And then the perspective here, in my lifetime, the issues that were not partisan, believe it or not, choice, gun control, trade, and raising the debt ceiling. So apparently that's, that with that start, that's why we needed an open bar here today. <laughs> Where are we? <laughs> A study by the Carnegie Endowment for the International Peace published in 2022 shows where we are. It covered 202 countries and went back two centuries to assess what degree each country suffers from pernicious levels of partisan polarization. For example, uh, does a country's citizens have such hostile views of their opponents that they're willing to act in ways that put democracy itself at risk? The author's conclusion uh, is pretty stark. No established democracy in recent world history is, has been more deeply polarized than we are right now. And we're not just uniquely polarized in the world stage, it also goes to how polarized we are in our, our history. Now, this is just one example I thought it was uh, telling, but also you know, somewhat humorous. In 1960, 4% of Republicans and 4% of Democrats said they would be displeased if their son or daughter married someone of the opposite party. <laughs> In 2019, 45% of Democrats said they would be unhappy if their child married a Republican, and 35% of Republicans say they would be unhappy if their child married a Democrat. <sighs> Having just uh, been through a, a wedding of my daughter, uh, I didn't ask as a political affiliation, <laughs> but I had a pretty good guess. Uh, how did we get here? And now we go to the magic board. Uh, gerrymandering, as part of this, put this in perspective. It is nothing new. I love this fact. Patrick Henry attempted to draw his district boundaries that would block James Madison from winning a seat in Virginia. So we didn't invent this concept. If you look at my map, you'd say, well, maybe we perfected it since that time. <laughs> In 2019, the Center for American Progress published a report that found unfairly drawn congressional districts shifted 59 seats of the House in 2012, 2014, and 2016. I was there many years, more Democratic, by far more people voted Democratic for Congress, and we were in the minority. 
And look, and I appreciate it can go both ways, and this is how we have why we have to change these th two things. Uh, so let's let me explain a little bit of in the end why this matters here. Um, this is the House of Representatives, 435 people. For those at home, I'll have to read these numbers because it's not high tech. So what, you need 218 to do anything, right? But let's look at these numbers. Right now, if the election was today, out of 435 seats, there'd be about 40 that you would call nail biters close. They could go either way. Right? There's about 50 something frontliners in the Democratic side. I don't know how many of the Republicans claim, but I'm assuming it's about the same. Now, think about that. That's how many seats are in play around 10%. So, if you're like me, I'm not worried about the general election. I am worried about a primary. Ask 90% of my colleagues, and they'll tell you the same thing. So what does that do? I'm not worried about fighting in the middle anymore. I say this generally. But as a member of Congress, what am I doing? I'm going over here. I'm pushing left. And what I've seen with my colleagues and really good friends on the Republican side who are centrist is they're now working for CNN or MSNBC, and they're doing, you know, cast there. They're consultants. They're doing something else. The real endangered species is centrist Republicans because they either lose, quit, and get replaced by someone over here. Now, the Freedom Caucus has 45, but it's really about 10 or 12. Now, we have unique names for them on the Democratic side, but when you ask Republicans about the folks way the heck over there, uh, they call them uh, uniques, uh, they have some thoughtful name, eccentrics, and so forth. So that's 40 seats that are in play. When I got elected in a special election uh, because somebody uh, went to become president, chief of staff, and then on to lesser and smaller things, <laughs> first guy to talk to me was Mark Kirk, a Republican, right? And he said, you're going to get a lot of advice here. Because you win a special election, you get sworn in by yourself, right? You just go up there, uh, they vote, you go up, you, you speak, you get sworn in, and then you start voting and saying, what the hell is H.R. 3729? Uh, you get thrown in the mix. But Mark put it on, I said, you're going to get a lot of advice. The best advice is everything that gets done here gets done in the middle. What if there is no middle? Right? How do you start doing this? <clears throat> now, I, I was pleased that we survived the debt ceiling and a few of these others, but just because we always have doesn't mean we will. I can't tell you how close we came to that. And now the deal is being literally reneged on. <clears throat> Speaker McCarthy said, yeah, those were the numbers then, but now they're different. <clears throat> and then I was talking about 20% change. So do we shut down? Do we have a CR, which is a failure as well? So it gets tough. But what really drives that is this number. One, to become Speaker of the House, because look at these margins, 222 Republicans, 218 Democrats. This is a four-vote margin. People don't show up certain days, right? So you've got to have, it's tough anyway, being a Speaker or a leader, right? Speaker Pelosi once said, it's like herding cats, but every cat thinks it's the smartest cat. <laughs> so we have a lot of people who think they're genius cats. <clears throat> but over here, I don't even think, and again, I'm not talking about Diaz Ballard and the other appropriation folks. I disagree with them, and they disappoint me. But they're my friends, and we work together, and a lot of times we can get something done. But when it only takes a couple, to throw a vote off, you saw the whole place shut down. But it only takes one under the new rules to call for a new vote for who the Speaker of the House is. They have used this 
they said, oh, there hasn't been a vote yet. Yes, but that's why we have gotten so scary lately. So now what do we do? Appropri I'm an appropriator. I'm a cardinal on appropriators. I'm a, I'm a ranking dem. We win the House back. I'm a chairman. Um, it's 12 bills that fund the government. So what happens? We go back, and the Republicans, and as much as these appropriators are trying, maybe they do, maybe they don't pass all the 12 bills, probably just a few of them, <clears throat> probably not even all of them out of committee because they can't get consensus, especially with these new numbers. So what do they do? They, they post it. They just put them online. They actually don't pa pass them out of that session. So the Senate, I predict, because they want a robust defense bill, we'll figure something out, is my prediction. They did on the debt ceiling, and that's the vote we ended up having to come back to, came back to the House. <clears throat> so in the future, what you need to watch is, we get done with the appropriations process now, the Senate's gonna do something in conjunction with the President, it comes back here. So I say to um, Womack and some of the other Republicans, does he put it on the floor? They go, well, he has to. Everything that we said before, it has to, they can't, it has to be, it's inevitable. Look, nothing's inevitable until it's not. What I'm saying today is, it's not guaranteed anymore. This is a new world, and it's pretty traumatic. So, you know, how did we get here? <clears throat> Uh, I think gerrymandering was part of that by creating districts like this, uh, by creating uh, state rep districts uh, first and then moving them over. Uh, I thought this was funny, fun to read and uh, explained it a great deal. Depressing as it may be, a Stanford study published last year why the state general assemblies have gotten so extreme, and they're the ones who draw the congressional maps. So uh, they did a study of state legislative candidate ideology across all election stages using a new data set on primary and general elections, over 84,000 candidates. They saw a steep rise in the success of, on both sides, ideologically extreme candidates. Now, part of that is, as you know, who comes out in primaries? Folks that are a little more involved, engaged, and you would argue in some cases more extreme in their views. Uh, and extreme doesn't have to be a horrible word. One finding from the study showed that the more ideologically extreme candidates in state primaries have an advantage that has doubled since 2010. In that time, moderates have seen the once favorable advantage of being a moderate in general elections shrink to nearly zero. This is where we are. Uh, we can blame it for a lot of things. I talked about this. We talked about the echo chambers. I thought it was interesting to do some of the analysis of how people get their news. So uh, obviously, this isn't the best way to get it, but it's the most common. But the, when you analyze when people read newspapers to get their news, the fact that there was a much multifold greater likelihood that there'd be writers and columnists in stories that they disagreed with. We don't want that anymore. And I'm gonna blame both sides to a certain extent, right? The word compromise does not poll well in political polls. I have very smart people in my district say to me, you get this done, but don't you compromise. Which one do you want? <laughs> Our friends from the ALS community are here today. Yay. <laughs> we passed the Act for ALS bill with uh, our friends Brian and Sandra playing a big role as well as the group. Uh, that had the most bipartisan co-sponsors in any bill in that uh, term in Congress. I was a proud sponsor of that. So I see little glimmers that we can do this. But boy, the windows are narrow on all this. We talk about misinformation. You know, uh, 
we talk about it on the floor a great deal. We talk about it in Congress all the time. But uh, how you address this uh, affecting social media now is an amazing challenge. And well, we haven't come close to it. But I guess the way I described it one time uh, when I was on one of the networks, it just sort of came to me. I said, well, we grew up saying, I'll believe it when I see it. And I said, but now it's, I'll see it when I believe it. So the audio version of that came out today with President Trump and the classified documents. He said, it exonerates me. OK. But the fact is, it, in their minds, it will. So we, we just can't see this. And if, if truth is, is so fragile, uh, truth as a great unifier is lost, we have real problems. Now, let's blame the politicians here. It's really easy to get caught up in this, right? Uh, after January 6th, uh, or people trying to carry a gun on the House floor, people voting even though they knew in their, they told you they felt differently about the election and challenging that. I'm telling you, it's, t it's tough to get past that. But you have to. But you catch yourself, and frankly, it, it helps you politically, right? I mean, Marjorie Taylor Greene will tell you that when she gets bombastic, her donations pile up. You can watch it in real time. So members have picked up on that, and they understand how they got there. I once had a guy who was part of the old uh, Tea Party, and he, a Republican friend of mine, he said, I thought they elected me because I was just the best candidate. And then when I lost to a guy five times farther right of me, I realized that for some of these folks, his words, they were just voting for the craziest person on the ballot. <sighs> so we have to be mindful of this. What I tried to do during the Ukrainian investigation, the Russian investigation, the impeachment investigation, um, back to our chart, I had Wolf Blitzer say, why are you trying to impeach? You know you're running into a stop sign with the Senate. And they're the jury. And I disagree, because I felt this is the jury, right? What Wilson said, the small percentage of Americans that decide all these elections, which is being borne out. <clears throat> I don't always behave the way I should in that regard, but we need to be mindful of it, because I think it's more productive. I think that what the first impeachment did was instruct a lot of that group in the middle that there were issues that they should consider. And it doesn't help to yell or shriek or scream or whatever pe different people do. That's sort of what seems to work uh, if we're going to change things. Um, and I'm, I guess I'm also reminded that at the time we were obvious, it wasn't polling then, but we were most polarized and, and damaging as it was the Civil War. So you would imagine what today's leaders would say during the Civil War. But what did Lincoln say in less than three minutes at Gettysburg, right? He talked about a new birth of freedom. He didn't uh, attack those on the other side. He later in his second inaugural talked uh, about with malice toward none, with charity for all. Ask yourself who's talking like that today? And worse, how would people react to it? I've had people say, I want you to be angry on TV. And then I say, well, what do I do the next time? <laughs> Again, if you're only going to talk to your base, the base of the base, not to be too harsh, um, you're not going to change anything. But I'll tell you, people have to be willing to listen to it. Uh, just in terms of how it has a worldwide respect, as a result of all this, I think the, the rest of the world has begun to lose faith in us. I've been to 54 countries, talked to my counterparts in parliaments all over the world, and you know, they would show you the headline, Leader of the Free World Meets Putin, and it was Angela Merkel. Uh, there's a lot of lost faith. Now, I think President Biden has regained much of that in the way he unified the West toward uh, uh, the war in Ukraine, and that was particularly helpful. <laughs> And I do think they think, by and large, America is back. Uh, but they're worried that that's not for long. And I'll say this. 
the members I talked about, uh, particularly those from Great Britain, you know, they're not immune to this. It's happening there. It's how we got Brexit. So if this is a cancer, it's a cancer that's spread throughout the world. And uh, I think we can learn from them, and especially with the extremes. So uh, before I finish and uh, just uh, answer some more questions, let me say this. Putting this in the perspective, it's interesting. We go back to Lincoln, but way before the Civil War, in January of 1838, speaking in Springfield, which I understand is still there, <laughs> got to take a shot. <laughs> At what point, then, is the approach of danger to be expected? I answer, if it ever reach us, it must spring up amongst us. And I, it cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. Lincoln was saying, America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. Now, I'm breaking the rules because I know in the end all these speeches I'm supposed to tell you. But I have faith. Because I know we've done this before. I think what struck me on January 6th and how close we came on debt ceiling, and I'll tell you 20 other things, is you talk to members of Congress, they'll feel the same way. There's no longer a certainty that we're going to recover, that we'll get past this, that the new norm isn't you know, forever. So... You can call it whatever you want, a call to action, all right? but it's not a kumbaya, walk out arm in arm, that we're all going to be okay. Because as Lincoln put it, just because we haven't destroyed ourselves means, doesn't mean it's not possible. Some things are inconceivable until they're not, like January 6th, or maybe we default next time. So look, on a national basis, we'd better expand how we get our news and occasionally uh, read things we don't agree with. We need to find a way to draw maps to address this issue. At least half of us should be worried about our general election, right? Because then I was like, oh my, oh my God, I better care what they think about. It's, it can be that fundamental and that simple. We must remind ourselves that empathy and compromise are to be admired and encouraged. Or that to-do list I read from at the beginning, it's just not going to matter. So I want to, and I've finished all my City Club speeches with notes of uh, optimism and so forth. So who but, who better this morning than Barack Obama, and his, the quote is, to put in context this morning's release of a Supreme Court decision? Boy, I'll take the glimmer of hope. Uh, he writes, today the Supreme Court rejected the fringe independent state legislative theory that threatened to upend our democracy and demand our, demand, dismantle our system of checks and balances. This ruling rejects the farthest right theory that threatened to undermine our democracy and makes clear that courts can continue defending voters' rights in North Carolina and in every state. Uh, thanks for making this happen. So, okay, I'll end with a bit of hope there. But if anyone imagines that this is the last of this and that we're not into this for the duration of our lifetimes here, we're fooling ourselves. Uh, I think we're going to be OK. But uh, hope means nothing if there's not a lot of effort with it. So thank you for having me. I'll answer any questions you might have. Oh, thank you. sure. Thank you, Congressman. Excellent. You covered so much, yet there's so many things that we'd like to uh, so many more things we'd like to hear from you, so we sure. hope to come, have you come back on a regular basis. Uh, until then, uh, we do have a number of questions, uh, and I, I ask that if anyone still has a question, please get it up. I don't know that we can get to them all, but, but please pass them on up or over to Amanda. Uh-oh, I see a handful there. So I'm going get, to get moving right away here. Um, let's start, Congressman, with uh, a question from Ryan Gleason, who's from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Yep. Um, Ryan, if you're here, please uh, raise your hand up. What do you think the appetite is in Congress for further permitting reform after the debt ceiling deal? 
and to build on infrastructure. Yeah. Well, look, the infrastructure bill, first time in our lifetime, every president previous to this wanted to do a big infrastructure bill. <clears throat> There's a school of thought. President Obama passed the health care law. If he had passed the infrastructure bill first, uh, maybe there's a second term where we control the House. But uh, kudos to President Biden for, for getting it done. Uh, I will tell you that the current, and I'm the ranking dim on this, T-HUD appropriation bill eats up <laughs> the transportation side of that infrastructure dollars to pay for the cuts that they're talking about. So it's precarious. Uh, I'm all for going big. Uh, I'm convening a meeting with the transit agencies, top 10 in the country this fall, because when the COVID money runs out, you know where the ridership is, right? It's in the 20s, 30s percent. Uh, there's a new norm of how people are gonna get around. We have to adjust for that, but the infrastructure needs to be there in the meantime. Uh, on permitting reform, uh, I think a lot of this that matters has to do with uh, our transmission lines. I'm an author of a bill that addresses that because they can. If we're going to deal with climate change and we're going to have the energy we need, so uh, our environmental community and all of us who care about sustainability and they care about the economy, we've got to redo the way we do those lines. And that should be part of a massive compromise bill this fall. I hope we can get there. Uh, because it, it ties all those things together and recognizing that our infrastructure isn't the last hundred year infrastructure, right? But it needs to be big. I mean, think about when we did massive infrastructure. Lincoln continued the transcontinental railroad during the Civil War. FDR uh, rebuilt the country during the Depression. Right? Eisenhower came back from the Second World War and built the interstate highway system. So you can dream big and build bigger, uh, even in the worst of times. Thank you. Um, quite a handful of questions here. Um, and I will say, and unfortunately, so many of them are about such a, an important topic, and that's Russia. Um, right. A couple of, Talk about you know, Russia. a number of specific questions <coughs> asked from the lad. We had, well, let me generalize uh, it, and it'll cover could, as much as I can. Please that's do. Okay. Thank sure. You. Look, uh, this is uh, the, the greatest example in my lifetime of opportunity and danger completely married together. Uh, how can you be optimistic from this? Uh, Putin isn't the strong man that, right? This is Prigozhin pulling back the curtain, and there's the Wizard of Oz. Uh, very dangerous wizard still, but a weakness there that you wouldn't have seen before. The fact that he was able to criticize Shoigu and others openly, the fact that Putin needed him to fight this war that was supposed to be over in th three days, right? Uh, the Soloviki, the far right nationalists in Russia, they weren't mad that he did the invasion. They were mad that he bungled it, right? So there's weakness. Now you lose the, the Wagner group. What else do you lose? They're dismantled. They may be scattered. Prigozhin said, you scatter them to the army, they're all going to be cannon fodder and they'll be useless. Uh, and then the fact that he made those comments critical on the justification of war. Don't underestimate that, right? Because I promise you Putin can't shelter and keep those words away from the troops on the ground. The fact that he was able to take Rostov on Don so easily, he was greeted. So mindset alone, that's openings and opportunities uh, for our Ukrainian friends. At the same time, you saw everything matters there, right? Putin has to show he's the tough guy still. You saw that sort of press conference he did with the military guys and the big hats. <laughs> Everything's for a reason there. So I was in uh, Ukraine last year, and I was in Bucha. I saw the results of his war crimes in, on mass graves. Uh, what will he do to reassert himself, right? They blew up the dam. There is a power, a nuclear power plant there who has far more reactors than Chernobyl did. So this is a very dangerous, wounded animal. So there's opportunities there. But on the other hand, 
Uh, Putin's capable of anything, 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 and we should be concerned. And finally, oh, with Putin, if Putin goes, this isn't a uh, Russian spring, right? It will be, I mean, it would it have been you know, Prigozhin, uh, a war criminal who admitted that he led the, the uh, troll farm that attacked our democracy in 2016? It would be somebody like that, right? Someone part of the Siloviki. You can go down the list. Uh, so, you know, did Prigozhin say, ah, you know, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to work. Sees the Chechens coming over. Um, and obviously the irony is he was what? Uh, Putin's caterer and probably doesn't want to eat anything now. <laughs> yeah, all things. So uh, uh, the... the there was a coup in 91 in Russia. They survived, but four months later, there was no Soviet Union, four, four months later. So um, it's an extraordinary situation, ripe with opportunities and ripe with danger. Hopefully we can have you um, back very soon when it's all over with the best outcome um, to, to summarize what Mark you your think happened there. For... <laughs> would, be, would be amazing. Um, Okay, so this is a great example of how the, the depth and breadth of, of, of being a congressman and all that you have to know and, and be involved with from international relations to uh, what's going on locally. Uh, John Miller asked, uh, your office is at the national level, right? And, and obviously you deal with all sorts of things at the very high level, but, um, but it's important to be involved in, in problems at the local level, specifically the unacceptable uh, acceptable level of crime in Chicago. Could you talk for a minute about that? Sure. Um, you got to appreciate that uh, there are some limits of what we can do on the federal level. Uh, one is to provide local jurisdictions with the assets they need um, on both sides of this to address the core problem that the societal problems that create this uh, dramatic increase in violence uh, but also to help police do their jobs cop grants I had an earmark that uh, purchased 500 bulletproof vest for Chicago Police Department uh, so uh, that's at least part of this helping to address the core problems and helping the police do their job I've got three years in a row with earmarks that help CPD do their jobs uh, better. And then you've got to get to the fundamental issue of gun violence and guns. Uh, what, 60-something percent, all of them probably has it in the top of their heads, um, of crimes, guns confiscated during violent crimes come from other states. So what are we talking about here? Robin Kelly actually has a really good bill dealing with gun trafficking. It's, n it's not against the law to traffic guns. They're actually prosecuting these people based on falsifying the paperwork. You know, what are we talking about here? And then obviously, look, uh, assault weapons and universal background checks. That is the low-hanging fruit of the low-hanging fruit, right? Uh, I, was, I witnessed uh, President Obama and Michelle Obama crying the day after a, a kindergarten was wiped out. Um, and in my mind, if we couldn't do it then, I'm not sure we can do it, right? And I, I tell folks on the other side, I said, well, you're not going to use an assault weapon to defend your business, your home. You're not going to hunt with it. You're going to hunt people with it. So we've gotten a few measures passed. I passed a bill uh, last year that required when uh, somebody who shouldn't get it, isn't allowed to get a gun tries to, that the feds have to notify local police and prosecutors. We've got another one that helps track illegal guns and make sure that uh, gun shop owners uh, check their inventory more than they do. I'm going to tell you, this is incremental and we should be leaping forward. Uh, so there's a number of things we can do to address these things, broad and, and, uh, and narrow as well. It, has to re it just requires the coordination. Uh, I've talked to the mayor about this. Uh, he's very open. He met with the delegation yesterday. Um, so I'll be honest, <laughs> until you flip these numbers, with all due respect to my colleagues, the bill will not get on the floor. We need to teach civics in this country. Unless you have more than the other side, a meaningful gun bill will not 
see the light of day. Bills don't eventually get to the floor anyway. And by the way, the other reason this number matters, that's what a discharge petition requires. So we would need some Republicans to sign a bill to get it on the floor. And that's where it gets tricky. So that, that actually leads perfectly into one of our last night. We have a lot of questions, not a ton of time, but Jackie Robinson Ivy asked, uh, when you say America is back, but not for long, what does that say about our, um, our future 2024 election and right. perhaps what might happen here? Yeah, uh, I have no good idea. <laughs> um, this far out, nobody could have predicted what happened in most of the presidential elections in our lifetime, right? This far out, how many Americans knew who Jimmy Carter was, uh, Barack Obama? Uh, so I'm with President Biden. Uh, I think he's one of the more underrated presidents in American history. And doesn't get the credit for it. I think uh, coming out of a pandemic, a massive war, which he is as responsible as anyway, anyone's for unifying the West, um, record employment issues, and uh, infrastructure, a long, long list. But I understand what the issues are. On the other hand, I have no idea how the Republican primary system flows through this. If you look at the real numbers, it's hard to imagine that President, former President Trump's not the nominee. So back to how the rest of the world views us, they, they look at this and say, what the hell's going on? And that's why they say, well, not for long or for how long. Sure, you're back, but who knows what happens and uh, you know, does the country swing back to such extremes? And that's fine, fine. Let me just, I'm hitting the obvious on the head. If we're not acting here and it's just one extreme or another, it, it makes it really hard for some continuity and some compromise on all those big things that we're trying to do. And it starts with there's one president. That's silly really issues, quick or? That's heavy. There's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of big issues. Can we close with one even bigger than that, though? Debt ceiling? Didn't we talk about that? No. Sorry. Go for it. All right. <laughs> and then I have one more for you. That's All right. Really debt ceiling, real quick. Uh, the debt ceiling's been raised 72 times in my lifetime, 54 under Republican presidents. Didn't used to be partisan. 18 times under President Reagan. Three times under President Trump. Can you tell I've said this before? Eight trillion dollar increase. The fact of the matter is, we did Simpson Bowles under, wait for it, President Obama, the only president who put together a commission to address the long-term issue of our debt. 31 trillion right now. But fact-checking both sides, you, you gotta be fair. 10 trillion of that comes from, wait for it, the Bush tax cuts and their extension and the Trump tax cuts which according to the Tax Institute and the Goldman uh, said helped about 1.5% of the American people grew the economy somewhere between 1.5 and 2%. What are we talking about? In the Second World War, the beginning of the Second World War, we raised taxes to pay for the war. When we invaded Iraq, we cut taxes. So Speaker Ryan and I used to have this interesting dialogue, and we finally agreed in our conversations with the big group that if you're going to do this, it has to be big, balanced, bipartisan, and through a significant period of time. And that means it's got to have cuts and um, new revenues. We got to go back to where we were if we're going to address this. So Simpson Bowles comes over to the House of Representatives back then, and it's called Cooper LaTourette. LaTourette was a Republican, the late member from Ohio, good guy, and Jim Cooper, former member uh, from Tennessee. And it got, wait for it, 36 votes. So you, you see these numbers? <sighs> Very few D's and R's voted for it. There's a lot of sacred cows in DC. You go there, there's sacred cows walking down the highway, walking down the hallways going into the House floor. So until we get past that, you know, I just don't want to hear from my friends. The Democrats just want to raise taxes 
and raise and raise uh, the debt. Uh, you want to talk about this? Uh, let's talk about everything, and that has to include the Department of Defense. It has to include revenues, and for everybody else in this room, has to include our sacred cows too, because you're just not going to get to the number. Gates said, Secretary Gates said before that, um, the biggest threat to our country's national defense is our debt. So we got a lot of work to do. Uh, you need folks willing to take really tough votes and be prepared to have it be their last term in office. But if that's what it's going to do, going to require to get there. Great. And we'll close on uh, a, a more local issue from one of our favorite aldermen, uh, Brian Hopkins. Top 20 anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I can't exclude anybody, Brian. <laughs> does your congressman, does your hesitant optimism, which is a great way of explaining, uh, extend to the Blackhawks? <clears throat> and if so, who should be on a line with Connor Bernard? So this is when I get a chance to, to beat up the city of Philadelphia. Um, I can't complain anymore. I made a deal. All right, I'm going to say this for the first time. I made a deal with the Almighty twice now. One was during a rain delay in Cleveland. <laughs> I was with a friend of ours, John Borovica, and uh, he was there to, to uh, attest to that. So the idea was I would never criticize the Cubs anymore, as easy as that is. But I made a deal. In 2010, before overtime, the Hawks beat Philadelphia. Pat Kane scored this goal in overtime. Hawks win the first Stanley Cup since 61. I made the same deal. But I have to tell you just a little side story because I find it really humorous and, uh, you know, not a big fan of the Philadelphia Flyer fans. So a quick aside, I'll try to take it. All day long, there are Philly fans and Blackhawk fans fighting in the stands. But I was an old second balcony season ticket holder. Brian and I know we play hockey once or twice a week. I'm just hunkering down because I want to see him win, right? So Kane scores. Now it's a disputed goal, so I have to wait till it comes back. And then I sit on my chair and saluted my Flyer fans in a way that my predecessor, Rahm Emanuel, would have been proud. Yeah. I went around the whole room. So uh, I'm getting showered with congratulatory beer. <laughs> and I see, on my way out, they're taking me out, I see, I see a guy from Channel 7. He goes, Congressman Quigley, we're live in Chicago. What do you think about these Blackhawks? And I said, oh, I thanked Rocky Wirtz, and I thanked McDonough and the whole team and so forth. And he says, and what do you think of these Flyer fans? And I'm not proud of this. I said, well, they need a shave and a shower. And as for the men, now, the problem was I was surrounded by Flyer fans. And that guy, that guy of head of security in the NHL says, I got to get you out here. I can't protect you. But they couldn't get me out, so they put me on the ice. And now I'm with the Hawks. And I love the Flyer fans. And Jay Blunk sees me, and he goes, so we go in the locker room, and I'm in the Winnie locker room, and this is OK. So uh, one of the Hawks is holding the cup, and this is against all the rules. He sees me, and he goes, here, hold this, because you're going to get something. And just as I turn, there's a photo of me holding the Stanley Cup <laughs> in the Winnie locker room. So the answer, a long-winded answer to your question is, I can't complain. I can't do anything. I made a deal just before then, twice now with the Almighty. So uh, the Blackhawks are going to do great. Everything's fine. Thanks for coming. We'll see you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Some great optimism. <laughs> Thank you again, Congressman. So much more to hear. And in that spirit, we will, uh, and of course, invite you back uh, with our one-year membership uh, and, and encourage you to come back and join us great. Uh, next year and, and perhaps before then with so much that you have to share. Uh, thank you again for uh, all of you for being here. What a great uh, combination of Chicago civic and, and uh, you know, cultural philanthropic. Um, and, and Congressman, if you allow me just one moment before, you sure. know, I think so many of us heard of about someone who, who shows up here often. And um, I just want to recognize Jim Crown, who we lost tragically uh, this weekend. And, um, and, and I, I think what we can do instead of ending on a, on a sad note like that, maybe, maybe encourage everyone. Jim showed up. He showed up for Chicago, just like his parents did and, and continue to do. Yeah. Uh, and just like so many amazing Chicagoans with their own resources. And, and whether that be 
the ability to convene or or the or some unique academic uh, knowledge and, and ideas. Uh, there's so many things that that Jim had been doing and, and continued to do for Chicago, and so many resources that he's laid the groundwork for so much more that's to come. Um, so incredibly sad that we that we lost Jim and such a true Chicago civic leader and example of all, all like so many of you. So I encourage you all to keep showing up in, in Jim's honor and keep up the great work of moving our incredible city forward and, and hope that we can take his example and, and keep all this going. So thank you for being here. Please come back. You're welcome anytime. And uh, in, in fact, we have a great program tomorrow. Uh, if you are not a member, please sign up, become a member, and there will be there's so many so many more programs to come. And hopefully, Congressman will have you back. And really appreciate uh, your incredible uh, remarks today. Thank you all again for being here, and have a great rest of your week.